Okay, you're ready. Thank you. So, clear black show, everyone. Hey. <laughs> Uh, there is a clicker thing. Clicker? Jealous. So the first time you invited me, you were curious, you know, because it's like, oh, who is this person? The second time, it was like, she said, what? The third time's on you, I'm afraid. Let's see if I can just get this up. Oh, okay, I get to type my password in front of people. Lovely. Okay, there we go. Okay, hi everyone. As mentioned, I uh, was a senior online consultant for Sony. I've now moved back into studio life because I just really may missed making video games. And uh, one of the big challenges in that job was I often had to take on huge mountainous problems. I had no way of solving. And I've had to take this on in code bases as well. One of the biggest distinctions I find between experienced programmers and junior programmers is a junior programmer will go in and everything's broken, it's doomed, we have to fix everything, and they'll make this massive change to the code base to achieve quite a small thing. Where a senior programmer will kind of just slide into the project and they'll be like, okay, I'll make these changes, I'll get this feature shipped, and they'll just get up to speed much quicker. And this is kind of a global way of thinking. It's not a big idea I want to express to you. Last year and the year before, I had a whole bunch of ideas I wanted to condense into a talk. This really is one quite simple idea that I want to tell you, and then I want to tell you some funny stories about why this is a thing, and then you can understand why clickers don't work. Oh, well, fuck it. No, that doesn't work. There we go. Does that work? Ah, there we go. It's just a focus issue. Lovely. Okay, so I learned the idea of critical thinking really early on from one of my favorite authors. Uh, Terry Pratchett wrote this book, Truckers. I highly recommend it. It's a trilogy of books. And it's about these little gnomes. Um, these little gnomes are living in our world, and they have a hunter-gatherer society. They're like, um, I'd say, Bronze Age, maybe pre-Bronze Age, in our modern world. When I say modern world, it was written in the 80s. Um, so there is a whole bunch of context, the VCRs are still a thing. Uh, but these little guys, it turns out, are actually aliens from space. And he discovers very early on, from a magical talking box, which is actually the spaceship AI, that um, his race has this whole history. And they've all forgotten it. And very early on in the book, he gets the mission of save the entire race and go back to space. And this little gnome can't really fathom that problem. He doesn't know how to solve that problem. That problem is way too big for him. And as programmers, so often in times, we're told, you know what, can you solve this problem? No one else in the room knows how to solve, including you. Oh, and can you do it on a time scale, please? And that's a really daunting task. Um, there's very few times, in fact, a programmer's job is actually really boring when you're doing stuff you know how to do and you're really just typing out the code because you have to do it. The interesting stuff and the reason why we do games is because we're solving problems that no one knows how to solve, big stuff that we've never tackled. And so how this little gnome does it and how critical path thinking works is you go, here's this huge mountain what are the small, little steps I have to take? What is the very next problem I have to solve? Not what's step 100, not what's step 50, literally what is step one, what is step two? What do I need to do right this second? What problems do I have to solve right now before I cl climb this mountain, before I cross the gap over to my dream? You know, you're standing here, the shipped game's over there, how do you get between those two? And there's an old story in video games we talk about a lot. It's a concept we throw around, which we call timed triangle. And this is because the amount of time it takes for you when you get a new console, it's not so much a thing anymore because of pre-made engines and such. You get a new console, you want a triangle on the screen. 
when we talk about time to triangle, we don't talk about how long does it take to render a triangle, you know, or write some OpenGL or write some DirectX or whatever, and, this, and boom, there's a triangle on the screen. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is you need to load an engine uh, up, you need to have a framework, you need to be able to load models up, you need to be able to handle textures, you need to be able to have an animation system, all that kind of stuff, and then, whoa, there's a triangle that's gone through your pipeline. The flip side of that is while time to triangle can be a very tricky problem, the amount of time an average programmer just hacking away at it really quickly, even on a platform they've never seen before, to get a basic triangle onto the screen is really freaking quickly. And if you're doing a game that doesn't need textures or doesn't need a huge complicated animation system, why are you solving all of those problems? So instead of thinking, you know, how do I replace this big thing that has all of these widgets? Think to yourself, well, what feature do I absolutely need? And this is a difficult mindset to get into um, and to try to get you into this mindset. I'm going to tell you about all the times I fucked up, or rather, all the times me and my friends fucked up. We have removed the names of games and changed uh, details to protect people. Um, but yeah, these are some of our fuck ups, and then I have included some more public fuck ups. So, uh, one of my big mistakes, first time I'm a lead programmer, and uh, there's a game another studio had worked on. They had kind of failed. We had been subcontracted to finish the game that this other studio hadn't finished. And uh, it was on a proprietary engine that was being used by multiple teams, right? So, it wasn't just us working on this tech. Um, and in this game, we had these characters, these beautiful characters that were kind of core essential characters. And the part of the art style was very Jetson-y, right? And these characters were basically billboards. They were puppeted billboards, right? So lots of 2D stuff together. And that means lots of textures and lots of transparency. And any engine programmers, you know that basically you have your opaque pass and then you come to your transparency pass. And the traditional way to handle your transparency pass is you do a depth sort of all your transparent triangles and you say, okay, we depending on if you're front to back or uh, back to front, you order it all to the camera and you draw it in the correct order, right? Because otherwise, how can you solve this problem? Turns out this engine didn't have this idea in it. It didn't have this concept in it. And there's a reason for that, because they built what they needed. And there were other bigger budget games on this engine, and sorting the triangles in depth is actually quite an expensive process, and they didn't want to slow up their other games. So my first in in instinct, you know, well, this is not the correct way I read in books. This is not the correct way to do things. Your engine's broken. Fix it. My boss didn't like that. The company paying us money didn't like that. I got into arguments with engineers who are now my friends, who I respect, um, as an arrogant little twit, going, your engine's broken. It's like, no, we made some very intelligent decisions for the video games we're making. Figure it out. And I wasted a bunch of money and time basically trying to fix their engine. Then I stopped. I was like, well. We still have to put these triangles in order. This is a problem we have to solve. I'm not thinking to myself, how do we render these characters we have? I'm thinking to myself, how do we fix this inherent bug in the engine? And my next step is I'm like, OK, well, Maya, what if it looks like the engine mostly renders things in the order that has been submitted from the model when it's been decoded? OK, cool. If in Maya, I write some Maya, Maya script stuff and I tweak the Collada exporter code so that uh, in we, we can do a whole bunch of depth sort in the tooling chain and that'll hit the game and then the triangles will be in the correct order and the engine won't fuck up. Great! Turns out animation and a bunch of other details made that uh, tricky and I drastically underestimated the complexity of a Collada importer. If any of you have ever looked at PSD um, importers or Collada importers or proprietary fucking formats, magic numbers galore, and holy shit, is that code just a mess. So we're like, OK, um, that hasn't worked. I've wasted a lot of the company's money. I'm kind of in charge of this project from a technical side. I'm fucking things up. How do I fix it? 
And eventually, we figured out, well, you know, our art style is pretty simple, and it was actually the lead artist who saved my butt, a much more experienced person. And he was like, you know what, um, the only problem we're really facing is these characters have some weird transparency we can get rid of, and the outlines of the characters are a bit of a problem. And at the time, shaders were still relatively new on consoles, and I was like, oh, well, I've heard about this new technique people are talking about called pre-multiplied alpha. And I implemented a pre-multiplied alpha pass in the shader um, where basically you can, regardless of order, multiply stuff up and it's correct. It has some limitations, but in our case, it solved the problem. And that took me an afternoon to implement. <coughs> so yes, uh, that was kind of a, a big mistake on my part, not thinking about critical path. But sometimes you don't even have to actually solve the problem at all. Sometimes there isn't a problem. So same studio, uh, there is a board game thing we're doing, and we've got to roll dice. Right, well, it's year 2000 and X. Um, the way we do dice now is we do physics. We've got a physics engine, we're gonna roll physical dice. Don't roll physical dice. It looks terrible. The dice take forever to settle. If you've got other physics objects in the scene, it causes all kinds of trouble. Um, if you happen to be on a low-powered device, which we were, it's a whole bunch of overhead, and it just looks terrible. <laughs> so what we did is we're like, um, again, same lead artist. This, this man was a genius. I, uh, he did things with UV scrolling. Ah, oh, sexy, sexy UV scrolling. Um, but anyway, <laughs> and he was like, you know what? What if we just pre-bake it? So again, in Maya, he pre-baked the animation. We did about, oh, I think, something like 20 variants of dice throws. And then I'm like, but only 20 variants? People will immediately notice. And then he's like, aha, but UV scrolling. And it turns out that uh, if you animate all the dice, so they land with the one up, and then before you play the animation, you just scroll the texture so the correct dice face is in the right place. Wham! No matter what your result, you can use whatever animation you have. And it was a lovely little bit of sleight of hand, and it solved the problem wonderfully. And I think anyone who played that game was like, oh, those dice throws look really good. And if the physics threw up a dice throw that didn't quite look good in Maya, the artist could little tweak it and put a little bit of spin on it. And you know, it looked better than real life. So there we go. And that was a great critical path solution to this really complicated problem. And then one of my favorite public ones on this is uh, the half train head. Uh, how many of you have actually seen this before? So basically, okay, good, some people in the audience. Um, Half-Life, the original Half-Life, there's a train that you know, gets animated in the scene. And they didn't have a concept of like moving uh, along a path for inanimate objects. So they literally took an NPC and they replaced his head with a train. And there's literally just train head walking along. <laughs> and that's their solution. And it's beautiful. And as a player, you would have never guessed. <laughs> but it works. Uh, that's, that's kind of a beautiful sleight of hand of critical path thinking, you know? What do I absolutely need to do? to solve the problem. Um, and then sometimes it's like, is this really a problem? So back in the day, with arcade machines, there used to be these things called an attract machine, uh, attract screen. And it was really important that if I plugged in a Pac-Man game and it sat there in a bar, in a corner of a bar, and no one was playing it for a day or something, and it was just sitting there running on loop, that this machine didn't break. Turns out programmers can be kind of, um, cut corners at times, and sometimes we have state building up, and we have weird situations we get into, and it breaks. And on earlier consoles, where you had a press start screen, there's usually a technical submission stage called a soak test, where they basically take your game, they play it for a bit, they do some things with it, and then they leave it running for 24, 48 hours, depending on the platform, it was a different period of time, and they wait for it to crash. You would be amazed at how many games failed the soak test. Um, and one of the games we had, we had a, a scripting language like so many games do. We had taken a form of Python called Stackless Python. It's really neat, look at it. And we had it there and it was running along and it behaved pretty well. 
fun. And this wasn't a problem with our designers. They hadn't written bad scripting or anything, but there was a problem deep in our implementation of Sackless Python that meant we had a very, very slow memory leak. And in our soak test, the game would crash and freeze up. And we look at all this complex code, and we're like, oh, how do we solve this? And we scratch our heads about a day or so trying to fix this, you know, figuring out if someone wrote bad script or whatever. And I'm like, eventually the lead programmer sort of, because I wasn't the lead on this one, the programmer turns to me and is like, well, how much is it leaking? It's like, ah, oh, you know, over this much time, it's leaking a few K. Well, can we just double the amount of memory we give it? And we just doubled the amount of memory we gave it. And it passed soak. Now, if any poor sod wanted to leave it running for four days, it would all break. But who cares? <laughs> Uh, so that's how, we, that's how we solved that problem. We didn't solve it, we just hit it better. And it turns out, you know, we're not the only developers who are doing this. If you played the original Win Commander, um, in DOS there was a different memory modes, and one of the memory modes that you used in later DOS to access more memory was called HiMem. And there was a bunch of libraries that would handle this for you. And Win Commander was using one of these memory management libraries, and it turned out that when you quit the game, there was a crash in the memory manager. But only when you quit the game. And so it exited back to DOS, and it had this little error code. And they were like, how the hell do we fix this? Because again, this is a complex memory manager, right? You don't want to fix this. And they were really against the deadline. So what the lead programmer did is, in the compiled binary, he looked for the error string, and he changed it to, thank you for playing Wing Commander. <laughs> So if you've ever played the original Wing Commander and you see or saw thank you for playing Wing Commander, your memory program, uh, program just crashed. Uh, so yeah, sometimes you don't actually even have to solve the problem because the only symptom of the problem there was an error message. So, you know, hide it. Then sometimes the critical path isn't actually the small change, but the big change. We were working on a game and we had, uh, it was an underpowered console, and the animation system had all sorts of glitches and bugs um, relating to how the characters worked, because uh, if I recall correctly, it was to do with how we were pushing our matrices, and because we didn't, on this particular console, you only had eight ma hardware registers for matrices, and we had um, blending problems and such. And uh, it was a whole range of small little niggly bugs that we were getting. And obviously, the, um, if you've been listening to my story so far, you would think, oh, OK, so you did some clever hack to hide it. Well, no, what happened is the animation programmer was like, this system's fucked. This system needs to be rewritten. We said, no, we don't have time. We don't have time. So he took a long weekend holiday, got horribly drunk, and rewrote the entire animation blending system for this console in our engine. And um, the code was terrible and not very well commented, but damn, did it work fine. So, you know, ship it. We put it in, and it fixed all our problems. So sometimes the solution is literally just to throw it out and rewrite it. The critical path isn't necessarily the small step. The critical path is what is the quickest way, what is the direct line route to my goal? Similar thing, uh, same console, we had a situation where we had an animation rig uh, called a starfish rig, if you've ever seen it. It's very low bone count. And uh, we had these characters running around. And one of the problems with this is these characters, their hands needed to be in different um, like positions and stuff. And the artists are asking us to give us more bones so they can rig up the hands and do all the stuff. You know, maybe even just a mitten bone would be fine. And they were like, were like oh, I don't know if we can manage. I don't know if we can manage because we had multiple characters to handle. And uh, what we ended up doing is we implemented a vertex animation system in the vertex shader. So basically in this, well, it didn't, wasn't actually a vertex shader because of how this console worked and stuff. But basically, late stage in the pipeline, we um, just had like four different versions of the hand, and we just basically told the code to swap it out, like swapping a mesh almost. And we just swapped the hands out. And that solved our problem. We didn't animate them, we just flicked them between. And that, you know, fixed it. So sometimes you can, and basically for that, we built a whole frame animation system late stage in the pipeline. And so that was a, a little neat hack 
around the problem. So um, the cost of rebuilding is something I like to talk about a lot. Um, it's come up in console before, and it's one of the things I like about this, uh, this crowd is a lot of you are actually quite keen on the more technical side. And when people say to me, oh, you can't build your own engine, um, because how can you compare with commercial engine A that has all these features? You don't need all the features of commercial engine A. I'm not saying everyone should build their own engine. There are specific cases and stuff. But if you are building your own engine, you just need to solve the problems you need to solve. And if you're writing a 2D roguelike dungeon crawler, there's not that many problems that you have to solve there. And it turns out, like, if you're doing um, a procedurally generated universe game that has a particular thing in the style, do you really need textures? Maybe not. And if your entire pipeline's built without the concept of textures, then actually you can do some really cool shit, and you can put a lot more polygons onto the screen. So there's a, um, a whole range of weird and wonderful ways you can solve these problems, and they seem like insurmountable problems. But if you don't think about it in respects of, I'm going to build this wonderful generic system that everyone's going to use, and you think about, what do I need to do? What are the problems facing me right this second? Then it's possible. And I, you know, as I say, failed at critical path thinking many times early in my career. And I came up with this, um, that's a lie, I didn't come up with it, someone told it to me, but I just beat myself over the head with it repeatedly until it feels like I came up with it. Uh, the rule of three. If I implement code somewhere and it does a thing, great. If I implement code somewhere else and it does a very similar thing, great. Don't merge those two bits of code. When I have a third example of code that's doing almost exactly the same thing, that's when I make it generic. So if I um, had some animation code, for instance, that was specific to a single character, fuck it, write bespoke code for that situation. right? Because until you have three examples, can you even start to think about the generic solution, and do you even need a generic solution? You might have three bespoke systems that are doing similar things but different, and think, oh, maybe we should merge these, and then you find actu actually they're doing quite different things, maybe we shouldn't merge them. And that's actually a really important rule with this critical path, direct line thinking, is thinking about the minimum effort and thinking about not building big solutions, but building the little stuff. Ah, random generation. I know I've mentioned this before. I love procedural content. I love random stuff. Um, but I can be an idiot. I can be a really big idiot. Uh, maze generation. Uh, so this was actually started as a uni project, where it's like, I want to make a maze generator. And I wrote some maze generation code. And I looked at the math, and I was like, you know what? This is a general purpose solution. I can write an nth dimensional maze generator. It's mathematically trivial. OK, write that code. Great, it's all done. OK, so I can generate a 2D maze, and I really like this. Oh, I should make a game out of this, right? OK, so 3D maze, that's simple. You know, I put it in the 3D engine. 4D maze, how do, how do we do that? Oh, I'll add a color shifting mechanic. So you're in the blue maze. You can step left. You can go into the red maze. Then you can step right. OK, and then, oh, shit. And I realized that I'd made this terrible, terrible concept. But then later. I was working on a game that needed a maze generator, a commercial game. And it was a 2D maze generator. And I was like, oh, I've got that code. I can restrict it to two dimensions easily enough. And when I grabbed that code and I converted it to two dimensions, immediately, thinking about my specific use case, I was like, oh, you know what? This code can actually be much more optimal. And it was to do with a bunch of memory access and cache misses and how we actually went through all the memory. And the moment I said, OK, the thing I need is a 2D maze generator, I wrote a better code for the problem that was directly in front of me. Um, another place where this happened is we had a skeet shooting game. Mini game, you're shooting out skeets. Uh, so that's a very old English countryside thing. Americans do it as well, where you literally have like two little things, and they shoot like frisbees, clay frisbees. And you have a shotgun, and you're like, pow, pow. and the boss comes to me, and he's like, OK, so you're the skeet shooting mini game. Um, how are we going to write that? And I'm like thinking to myself, well, I have an idea. I'm like, OK, right. So 
based on where the cursor is and where the last shot was and what your current score is, we can come up with this algorithm that figures out what the next skeet is and da-da-da. Oh, okay, great. How long do you need to write it? Oh, two weeks? No, you got two days. Uh, okay. And I'm like, I got really angry. I went home and I got really angry and I drank a lot. And I got really angry. I'm like, but this thing would have been beautiful. And uh, it turns out that in my sort of drunken rage, talking to my programming friends, uh, one of them was jamming on a guitar, because he was in a band, because uh, that's what you do in university, you're in a band. And uh, we came across an idea, and it was like, whoa, classical music, sheet music. We immediately Googled sheet music. And I thought to myself, ha ha, if I take snippets of classical music and I use the tone to the pitch to determine like where it's going to be shot and the length of the note for power and stuff, and I do this stuff and I can take really upbeat, you know, like high tempo music for like hard, difficult bits and medium bits and I can just snip this bit of music and because it's melody, people immediately get it, they get the flow of it, it's got nice game balance and because it's music, I can kind of string it together and I know how this works, great. And I wrote that system in a day really quickly, and it worked really well. Because <laughs> it's like, it's music, right? And I basically stole from the masters, and it was all really nicely composed, and it had a great feel to it. It worked really well. But yeah, my first instinct, unless I had been beaten over the head, would have been to write this really complex system, and it probably would have had really bad timing and been really mathematical, but not that great. Another thing, and this comes up all the time with random stuff, and I know I mentioned this last year about generating offline, but when people are like, oh, what if we generate this thing randomly? And I'm like, or we could just make a big Excel table, generate like a thousand examples, and shove a list into the game. And that works, and it's testable. Isn't that wonderful? And you know, that's surprisingly often the answer for this random stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong, random stuff's really cool, procedural stuff's really cool, but if a list will solve your problem, maybe that's the step you take. But there is a counter, so um, it is important when you're climbing your mountain to think about what you're actually building and thinking about if these steps are getting you in the right place. And sometimes, when you're taking these small steps, you will occasionally go down a dark alley, but that's okay because you can back out. And the one nice thing about critical path thinking is you are always moving, right? You're always on the go. Occasionally you'll wander down a dark alley and get beaten up, but it's okay, you can walk back and you can try again. And in this case, we did that, physical cogs. So we had a cog puzzle game where a system of cogs is there, um, then we take away a cog and we show you similar cogs, and we say, which cog solves the puzzle? Which cog fixes it? And our initial instinct was, okay, we'll give this to the designers and they can design some cog puzzles and we'll shove the cog puzzles in. Turns out the designers really had a hard time wrapping their heads around mechanical cog systems. And it was actually a really hard problem to write a lot of these because we needed like a couple of hundred at diff different difficulty levels. And we thought, you know, they could knock them out. And it was just they couldn't wrap their heads around it easily. And then we're like, okay, well, we could go back to the original idea of randomly generating and figuring these out. And um, we assigned it to the programmer and we ran through it and gave him a bit of help. And we came up with a pretty good system where we generated a series of cogs and threw some parameters. And we started really simple. We were like, can, so the first critical step that we did there was, can we actually generate a functional set setup of cogs? Turns out that's really easy, because we're like, okay, cog A, cog B, blah, 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 make sure they don't touch. Great, that's super simple. And then we're like, okay, can we remove a cog and remove a significant cog? And it's like, actually, yeah, no, that's really easy, because as long as you're not removing the cog at the beginning or the cog at the end, it's fine. Very small step. And then we're like, can we determine how complex that is? And it's like, yes, how many cogs, like, what's the range of cog size? What's the cog ratio of big to small cog, you know, like how obvious is it? And how many times do we change direction of the cog spin? And then from that, we're immediately like, okay, so how do we pick how difficult we make the cogs? And it's like, well, are they really similar but turning at slightly different speeds or they're obviously turning in different directions? And what looked to us like a really complicated problem initially broke down really, really easy when we just committed to doing it. 
So yeah, sometimes um, you go down the alley and back up, but you do always keep moving, and producers love it when you show progress. So that's always handy. Then sometimes you just pack shit. Sometimes it's just funny. So there was a game that we did a port of from an old console to a new console. The game had already been released, the code was already in the wild, and it worked. Now, how many of you know um, why we have 50 hertz and 60 hertz in alternating current? All right, okay, so a few of you, cool. It's great YouTube videos, you should go look it up. Basically, we sucked the fan standard out of our thumb, and we had 50 hertz in uh, America, I believe, and 60 hertz in Europe, I forget which way it's around, but anyway, different in the two places. And this came up with PAL and in hit TSC, and back on old consoles, you didn't actually hit 60 frames unless you were in a Pacific region. Other regions, you hit 50 frames. And turns out, if your physics is tied to your render loop, and you now have to jump from 50 frames to 60 frames, or vice versa, your physics calculations are off, and the game plays differently. And so we're, you know, we're porting this game, we're looking through the code, and we came across a line, and we're like, what? What? And then, like, we look at each other. Have you ever heard of the measurement of code quality called what the fucks per second? Right? The more what the fucks, the lower the quality of the code. But this was a beautiful hack. This was a glorious hack. We look, gravity is 12 meters a second in Europe. What? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out it was, well, if you were in a different region where the physics has to run at a different step and you were just gravitational constant, the game plays mostly the same. It works. Um, turns out, unfortunately, we weren't able to keep that glorious hack because we had to re-implement a whole bunch of stuff, but I thought that was a beautiful hack. That was a glorious hack. Um, there was another game we were working on where uh, we had a race condition bug. So uh, often your game thread and your render thread will run separately, and they've got to organize with each other, right, when they access things. And sometimes you'll get a race condition, which basically Two things are running along, they come across it to like a crossroad in the street, and if they're behaving themselves, one will stop and wait for the other to cross, or the other will wait for the other to cross. And it's a nice little organization thing. Sometimes you can get yourself into a situation, and it's easier than you think. Concurrency can get quite tricky, especially when you're dealing with complex state, where a race condition occurs. And under a certain, under a certain set of circumstances, words are fun, um, we got a crash, and we scratched our heads, and we were like, what the hell is this problem? And it was really annoying, it was really, really annoying. And eventually, we're like, a game needs to run at 30 frames, right? Yeah. The render thread isn't pushing it to the max, right? Yeah. What if we just sleep the render thread for a bit? I don't know tried it, and it worked, and we shipped. And like, we couldn't repo the bug after that, no one could repo the bug after that, but it worked. Um, and so sometimes these hacks, you, you do have to do them, and, and we shipped with that. And to my knowledge, the bug never occurred in the wild. So, yay for us. Um, but yeah, you, you, you do get these horrendous hacks. I mean, there's one, uh, I won't mention the console, um, I do have to mention the countries that fr the country it's from, so I'll narrow it down a bit, because it was from Japan, because we had to go through language barriers. And this particular console had a situation where there was a special thread interrupt um, that had to, I don't want to be too specific, because I don't want to expose it, um, but it had an interrupt to do with audio. And we discovered that basically what it was doing is it wasn't resetting the stack register for the matrices when it did this interrupt. Because normally in a hardware interrupt, right, the, the hardware's moving along, something happens, and there's an interrupt and says, whoa! And then basically at a very low level, there's a whole bunch of operations that go on, and it's like, stop, and the code stops, and the hardware does some stuff, and then it says, continue, and you continue. And the code that's running shouldn't notice the difference, right? So what happens, is uh, in this situation, the stacks weren't being correctly reset. 
And this was a bug. I mean, we, we tore our hair, hair out over it, and it was horrendous. Um, but we eventually managed to figure out, because in the code, it would cause an animation glitch where the characters would just like look like a mess of vertices all of a sudden, right? Out of nowhere. You've all seen it before in video games where, you know, like the Fable Scar bug where it's all of a sudden like, I don't know. It goes all out of whack. You would be stepping through code that had nothing to do with animation, nothing to do with audio. And all of a sudden this bug would happen and you'd be like, what the? You would literally, you would go to the disassembly and you'd be like, okay, I, I see that assembly level instruction. It's fucked. Turned out it was a hardware level bug with the console. And because the console had shipped, and because um, fixing the bug would have broken titles that had already shipped on the console, this was still like, I think, six months after the console had launched, but titles had shipped. They're like, eh, we're not going to fix that. We used the, the same magical sleeping bug to and the magical sleeping dragon to uh, fix that bug as well in another game. Yeah, crazy. So um, a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is about complexity. Um, you know, if you're solving the problems directly in front of you and you're taking one step at a time and you're not thinking big picture, sometimes you can write kind of horrible code, but you don't have to. As long as you remember, you will write this code once, you might alter it occasionally, but the amount of times this code will be read, hundreds of times. Every time someone cares about what this code is doing, they have to come and they read through the function. So even when you're taking these small steps and you're taking what almost feels like hacks and you're solving small problems, as long as you are actually thinking this code will be read a lot of times, you don't actually have to write hard to read code you know, or hard to understand code. If we had come across that um, gravitational concept that had changed, right? And someone had bothered for a minute to put comment there. That's it, you know, because obviously some people comment where it's like for loop. The I increments the for loop. It's like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> um, but the gravitational comment, the constant change, that's a good time for a comment. That's a good time to say, you know what, we, we changed gravity because um, 50 hertz and physics, and this is why we did it. That's a good time just to stop and explain what you were smoking. Um, so yeah, just, just remember with copy-paste code, and especially if you're pulling stuff off, uh, so many times when people I see this in indie code a lot of the times, where people have pulled a solution from someone else and they haven't, they haven't included an explanation of the code, why the code works, why what the code does, and sometimes because it's code they've copy-pasted from someone else, they're like, I don't know, I just don't touch that file. And I've seen it, I've seen developers get scared of their own code. Um, so yeah, just remember, write, write once, read often. Um, but as I say, I want to reinforce to you that the important thing is you take small steps. The important thing is you solve the little problem in front of you, not the huge problem. There is an indie game I could name that we were asked to port. We didn't take up the contract because we were busy at the time with other things. Um, this is an indie game, very popular. Most people in the room probably have played it. Um, it has crafting in it, shocker. Um, and, you know, recipes, crafting recipes. If you take this and you do this and mix it together, you get this. Most games would implement that as some kind of data table or thing like that, right? That's the correct engineering solution. This person, and I could totally see how they'd done it, they'd been like, okay, so if you take this and you combine this, you get this. If you take this and you combine this, you get this. Fine, that's simple, right? Early access, early in their development, that's what they did. And they're like, well, if you can create this and you do this and the moon's in this position, then you get this. And it's wonderful, because every time they had to add a new crafting recipe, they just went into the huge if, nested if spaghetti, and they just added their condition. And for them, it was really easy to maintain, it was really easy to add new stuff to, but holy hell, as an external developer being asked to port this code, you just looked at this mess, and you were just like, what the fuck, 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 what the fuck. Um, and it was really easy for us to mock. But this indie developer, who had made a shit ton of money, had done the right thing. 
They had done critical path thinking, they had taken the small steps, they were being smart. And I take nothing away from that, that was actually fabulous. But there is a counter, right? There is a reason we don't use if statements for everything. And I'm gonna give you an example from university, because you know, that's when you do all the really dumb shit. A friend of mine, um, we were asked, so this is my third degree, the UK degree, the one I don't think is very good. Um, it was an assignment to do a checkers game. Whoops, do doo And he had managed to implement checkers without an understanding of like functions and loops and stuff. And so he had literally written almost every state a checkers board could get into as an if statement. <laughs> Which was fine, it worked. He had a checkers game, but then when handing in the assignment, we were asked, we, had, we were sat down in a lab, and we, the thing was like, okay, so small thing, you know, just prove this is your own code and stuff. Add diagonal movement. <laughs> and like, for the rest of us, it was like, oh, bum, 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 done, right, whatever. I think it was diagonal movement, maybe it was straight movement. Anyway, it was changed the movement slightly. And for most of us, it was like, done. He comes out after like an hour or so. It was like, oh my God, that was so hard. It's like, what? Because none of us had seen his code. It's like, I had to add this many new states. And you're like, what the fuck were you smoking? Like, what the hell? So yeah, no, solve the problems in front of you. Um, take small steps. This usually works, but there's a reason you become experienced as an engineer, and there's a reason we have these more generalized solutions, because you don't want to re-implement everything. But the key problem here, is you're trying to cross this gap. In front of you, there's this huge gap between you and your dream. And your first instinct may be that you need to build a bridge. I don't know how to fucking build a bridge. Building bridges hard. Laying stone, oh, you mean I've got to carve stone now? What, I've got to use mortar? Oh, right, okay. So, I do, do I know anything about a structural integrity? And it's like, right, oh, right, right, right. How many people need to cross this bridge? Oh, you'll sell it to a few hundred. Can I use rope? Okay, right, rope bridge it is. Um, and you can take these small steps. You don't need to be the next John Carmack. You don't need to make the next Unity or Unreal. You just need to ship your game, right? And we all write bad code. It's really even, so, I used to be really productive as a programmer when I was really young, because I started programming really young. I got into the games industry and I was game jamming right at early London days. I'm like, yeah, yeah, this is awesome, code's awesome. And then my career went in such a way that I was like, okay, well, so now I'm a lead programmer, great. And then I'm like, okay, so I'll do some of this design stuff and I'll be a lead designer for a bit and then I'll do technical design. I'm reporting to the board, I'm doing all this really important stuff, I'm really experienced. I'm still a fucking idiot. And I'm turning around, and in my free time, right, because I'm not coding day-to-day -day in Visual Studio, right, I'm forgetting how much bad code I've written, how much bad code I've shipped. And there was a period in my life, um, about two years ago, where I seriously doubted if I could code. I was like, shit, can I code? And I was trying to do simple projects. I was trying to do, like I had a project where there was a, I wanted to set up the Raspberry Pis with a camera to track my cats, right? Because I was stressed about my cats getting fat. Yes, I'm a crazy cat lady, fine. Um, and I'm sitting down to write this simple bit of code. This is not complicated code. And I'm trying to engineer a multi-scale solution that would be fit for Google. Because I'm an engineer, I'm a senior, I'm experienced. Shocker, I failed. Shocker, I kept on hitting my head against these projects, I kept on throwing away projects, I kept on trying to take part in game jams and not finishing them, I kept on failing. And I kept, I really severely doubted if I could be a programmer again. I thought, was I ever a programmer? Did I just blag all this? And it comes down to a very simple thing, right? All code is good code. I just beat my head into that mantra. All code is good code. Yes, there's, there's shitty code and there's good code, and yes, some code runs faster, and I'm a performance nut. 
You know, I'm the kind of idiot who will go into a function and be like, okay, so what's the compiler actually doing to this? Can we actually optimize this? I'm the kind of person who really cares about the low level. You know, I really care about co code quality. And it is important. It is important in places. 60 frames makes a difference. You know, there are definitely places there. But you know what? Any code that ships is good code. Any code that solves your problem is good code. If you're not writing today, if you're not drawing today, if you're not doing the thing you need to do to achieve your goal, take a small step. You don't have to ship the entire game tonight. You don't have to write the entire game tonight. You have to take a step in the right direction. Don't think about, I'm a little gnome, what the fuck's a spaceship? Think about, I'm a little gnome, what's the next thing I need to do? And that's the message I'd like to leave with you. Questions? Mike's wandering around somewhere. Anyone got a question? Come on. It's been three years. You know I don't bite hard. There we go. Right back. Uh, hello. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I've, I've just got a really quick question. How do you future-proof your code? Like, how do you think about what this function might do in the future and then sure, just, sure. just for the present. I've worked in a bank. I've got friends who work on real-time systems where lives matter. They have to be really careful about their code. Right? They have to do spec analysis, they have to do unit testing, there's a lot of stuff they have to do. I make video games, right? Like. Even when we are writing, so I, I'm now in Media Molecule in a studio and I you know, make games again, but my previous role, uh, tech, uh, online tech consultant, uh, we were doing uh, very serious things, right? We were working on the Sony platform level, right, where if we fuck up encryption or security on network systems, people's security could be compromised, um, credit cards could go amiss, all sorts of serious problems could happen. You don't build beautiful code. What you do is you have good systems, good processes. So uh, the first process in a stable sandbox environment that's exposed to nothing is you write the code you need to do. You write the minimal viable product, right? You take the critical steps in front of you. Then as you go through that to QA, to limited testing and stuff, your processes get code review in there, um, you have design meetings about particular implications of decisions you're going to make, um, you analyze what you've built, right? And too often I've seen people get paralyzed with fear of, and it happened to me, of what the fuck if I, you know, break Sony servers? You know, that's a scary concept. And the way you do it is, as I say, you, you write the code in front of you, and then you make sure, as a company, you have good processes in place to check that code and to analyze it to the level it needs to be, right? Because code has different quality standards. And if you are writing something that is, you know, in a hospital machine versus, a, you know, local couch co-op game, um, there's very little that a local couch co-op game can do that will really damage someone. In the worst case is things like save file integrity. And when you come to save code, you fence off your code and you get careful about what you're going to do. But yeah, no, the thing is, is we're human. We make mistakes. And you've got to just accept that and have good processes in place because people make mistakes. So don't try think about what if in the future to write the code you have in front of you. I hope that helps. Anyone else? Okay. Hi, thank you for an amazing talk. <laughs> so, um, for us uh, game designers here, do you have any tips on how we can become better coders or better at programming? 
Um, so the, the first tip I would say is, I don't think, I personally think every pro designer should have a basic programming skill set, right? But it doesn't matter if that skill set's in Game Maker, and it matters even less if the code you're writing is good code. If a programmer ever mocks a designer's code, tell them to fuck off. You're not paid to program. You've done the thing you needed to do to implement, to show. You can demonstrate your design, right? I don't care if you're demonstrating your design in Game Maker. I don't care if you're demonstrating your design with Lego blocks. As long as you can demonstrate your design, and if you can jump into the code, that's super useful. But again, if you're, you've got production code, right? and the designers are allowed to muck about in it, fine, have good processes in place. Don't let a designer commit to a live server. Instead, let the designer muck about and have their design branch or whatever, and then have, you know, if that code has to be merged into trunk, have a code to look over it and say, oh, actually, there's a consideration here where this would cause an issue, okay? And that's them bringing their expertise to help you. They should never mock you. They should just be there to help you. So just write the code. Honestly, if my friend can write checkers using just an if statement, he can do it. It's fine. Programming's easy. The hard part's getting good. Hi. Um, when you're writing code like step to step by step to step towards critical pact, as you're saying. At what point do you step back and say, well, I need to rewrite this because of quality? Like, where does the, where do you draw the line between this is good or not enough, or mm. this should be fixed so it's more maintainable? Well, um, as was mentioned earlier in one of the talks, it's important to play your game. It's important to have milestones and steps. So, um, for instance, uh, it depends on your discipline, right? So if you're a render programmer, you get something up on the screen, it's all working, it's great. You'll find there's natural lulls in development, right? There's a natural, we're really, really busy. Oh, I have a moment to breathe. And that's when you can go, OK, I'm going to profile my code. I'm going to look at it. And now that we have made all of these decisions, now we are further down the path. We have more knowledge, right? Because if you're trying to predict into the future, it's really freaking hard. But if you're like, OK, so we've done all these decisions, and under our current implementation, for instance, the example with my friend of the animation system, this system's no longer fit for purpose. We're like, OK, um, do we need to rewrite it? Because let's face it, we're engineers. We'd love to rewrite it. Oh, and don't tell me you're going to refactor it. I know you're going to rewrite it. Um, it's actually a really big f warning flag if you have a junior programmer especially or if you have a programmer who may be falling behind the curve sometimes, what they'll do is they'll get into a refactor mode and they'll do lots of small commits where they're refactoring code or they're moving furniture around. And you're like, you're not really contributing to our goal. You're not moving us down the path. Um, so it's important to know when you need to do that and why are you doing it, right? If you, if you look at a bit of code and you're like, OK, currently the game's meant to run at 60 frames and we're at 40 frames. What do we do to get back up to 60, right? Then there's a good argument to look at your code and go, OK, right, we can tighten this up. We can do this. Or if you're looking at your code and you're like, you know what? This loading screen's 15 seconds. Why the hell is this loading screen 15 seconds? We can get it down to five. That's a good goal. Right? But that's a goal the player's going to see. It's a m tangible thing. If you're going to say, you know, I rewrote the entire model import code. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. Do you know I don't even use any recursion in that code anymore? Who the fuck cares? Really, who the fuck cares? So yeah, it's, it, it, goals, milestones, externally measurable things. Understand why you're doing the thing you're doing. Anyone else? Oh, at the back there, we've got two. Uh, yeah, okay. So I'm guessing you have worked with uh, people from a lot of different backgrounds mm -hmm. during your years. Yeah. So I think there are mainly two approaches to learning programming, either through like university or self-learning. So have you noticed... Sorry, what was the first route? Self-learn and? Self-learning and uh, university and such. Oh, university, yeah. Yeah. So do you think there are any 
big differences like pitfalls that you can experience? Yeah, no, no. I think no matter what your background is, you have weaknesses. It's one of the reasons why studio diversity is important. So we have different strengths and weaknesses, and we can mix and match and figure out how we best complement each other. Um, I have uh, two computer science degrees. The first computer science degree I got in South Africa um, before I moved over, and that was literally it was part of the maths department. It was extremely theory heavy. We almost never talked about programming. We talked about like how electronics worked and we talked about like math and we talked about algorithmic theory. We were just expected to learn um, code in our own time. And that gives you a very um, enterprise mindset. It gives you a very good mindset to understand the full stack, uh, but it can lead you towards over-engineering. Um, then the other degree I got um, was in the UK, and it was more what I'd call a technical degree. They were much more focused on, here's how we build video games, here's Unity, here's Unreal. Well, actually, no, not Unity and Unreal. We were working with GameCube thing and stuff. Anyway, and that would lead you down a path where you were like, oh, OK, so we just build stuff. So those are two university educations that would l l end up teaching you different ways of thinking. And I think depending on if you're self-taught, if you're reading certain books or if you're following certain mindsets, you know, I've met people who, I've met like students and younger programmers who come up to me and they quote some grand truth to me and I'm like, you've been listening to so-and-so's GDC talk. And you know, so you can immediately see the influences in people's career. Um, so I think whatever it is, you're gonna have weaknesses, you're gonna have strengths. Um, it's just important to take a step back occasionally, self-analyze, work with different people, and over time you'll, you'll find those flaws and you'll find those strengths in yourself and you'll, you'll just adjust, that's just a process. Um, I, I think every way of learning is valid. Got one there and then another one in front. Okay. Uh, so I've written a lot of shitty code. Yep. A lot of unstructured code. Respect. And it's basically just the worst thing ever. So I'm just wondering, um, what are your views on commenting and documenting your code? Does it like? Do you have any tips for that? Not really. Um, I mean, the main thing I would say is common sense applies. Um, obviously, you you get people who over comment, like where they say, "Huh." The render function renders the game. Wow. Uh, you know, really inspirational comments like that. And then you'll get people who write really obscure code with magic numbers, and they don't even bother to say what that does. Um, there, there's a mid-ground. Um, there are big studios that don't even have proper coding standards. Um, but, oh my god, is it glorious when you walk into a place and the coding standards have been thoroughly maintained. And it's like, oh, wow, that's actually, that makes sense. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love Go, actually, is because Go as a language enforces a linter, and it immediately makes the code more obvious to everyone. But even in Go, you can write shitty code that no one can understand. So uh, I think a, a system that works, um, if you've ever worked with uh, code samples from Nintendo or Japan platform samples, not so much today, because these days translation's a lot better, but back in the day, like PS2 days, you'd come across Japanese code and then a really badly translated English comment. But for them, internally, where most, pe most people looking at were Japanese, you know, that works for them. So it, it's whatever process is there. The big thing to remember and I think writing clearer code is better than commenting or documenting it, um, you know, if you, if you can make it um, readable, is that don't be the smartest you can be when you write that code, because you're going to write that code once. And uh, there's an old adage, it's twice as hard to debug code. So if you write code that is at your limit of like, I'm being really smart, and look, it all fits into one line because I use the ternary operator, ain't I cute? and then someone has to come along and figure out that code, it's like, oh, that doesn't actually scan well, that doesn't read well, what's my intent here? Um, actually, intent's a good one. It was mentioned in, in the Funcom design talk. That's, you know, saying, this function's meant to do this is actually really useful. Um, you know, why am I doing all this weird stuff? Like, literally, week before last, I, there was a bit of code that appeared everywhere in the engine I was working on where people were taking this thing and you know, multiplying this matrix by this other matrix, inversing this matrix, and then doing this multiplication. 
And when you first look at it, it's like, what the fuck are you doing there? And then you look at it for a second longer, and it's like, oh, okay, it's really obvious. You're doing this transform. I understand why you're doing this transform. Oh, wait, this transform happens like 10 places in our code base. Um, I should just write a helper function. And the function name immediately says, does this transform? And now anyone who looks at that code like immediately grocks it. So there are little things like that. I believe there's another question in front there. OK. Cool. Well, we'll wrap it there. I'll be around. Um, again, I hope you achieve your dreams. Small steps.